So I just want to welcome everyone to tonight's cooking demo. Nice to see you all here. Hold on one sec here. This program is being filmed by Milton Access Cable, which means it can also uh, eventually be viewed online at their site. Also, I want to thank the Friends of the Milton Public Library for their support of my programming. If you have any questions during the demo, please put them in the chat box and I will pose them to our presenter at the end of each recipe. She will be cooking three different dishes with us tonight, and I hope you were all um, able to access the recipes and shopping lists that I attached to email for you in the last few days as I filled up your email boxes. Now, let me tell you about our talented chef. After working in the world of financial services for many years, Connie Spiros decided to follow her passion for food and entertaining by going to cooking school and learning from some of the greats, including Jacques Pepin and Julia Childs. She offered cooking classes in the Metro Boston area and hosted a Milton cable show called Meet Me in the Kitchen, creating more than 50 shows filled with tasty recipes for home cooks looking for inspiration. Her mantra today is cooking should be fun based on a simple recipe with quality ingredients and best when shared with people you enjoy. I also want to mention that Connie worked tirelessly with me to host programs for adults for many years, and I have so enjoyed working with her. She has also made our MPL bookshop a great success and has always supported the mission of our library in myriad ways. I so appreciate her great sense of humor, her friendship, and her wonderful creative spirit. Now, please join me in a warm welcome for Connie. Oh my gosh, how do I ever live up to all of that? I know, it was kind of long, wasn't it? <laughs> no, it's, oh no, it's never too long when it's about you, right? When it's about me. <laughs> thank you, Jean, so much. It's been great. It's been great working together for all those years. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. This is a big crowd, and it's going to be a lot of fun, hopefully. Um, I do want to just mention that I've been, this is National Friends of the Library Week, which is why we sort of picked this week to do this session. Um, I really do mean it, that eating with friends is the best thing you can do. I know we all know that, eating with family and friends. Um, it's been a little difficult lately to do that, but we're getting there. And slowly but surely, we will be at, back at a point where we can use all of these recipes and throw a party, or at least cook for our family and enjoy some new recipes. Um, I've been with the Friends of the Library for 20 years, and I just want to mention that it's one of the best things I've ever done. Um, the Friends of the Library support all the programming. We raise money. We provide the volunteers for all the programming that happens at the library. So if you participate in programs like this and you want to become a friend, just uh, go to our website, MPL for Milton Public Library, mplfriends.org. So um, I think the reason we've got a big crowd tonight is that people are at different stages of COVID. You know, when we first saw it, it when COVID first hit, we were eating at home, cooking three meals a day. Then we started, you know, a little bit later, a year later, we started taking out food when the restaurants open. And now I'm dipping my toe into the restaurant world, not totally in, but I know a lot of you probably are way ahead of me, but people are going back and they're eating in restaurants. But we're realizing also that when you go to a restaurant with your family or your friends, you're limited in the amount of time you can hang out. And I think I like to hang out and talk to my family and friends when, well, not all of the family and friends, but most of the friends. Um, when you want to enjoy a time out, you need to have it in your home. And so I really want you to look at entertaining, and I don't call it entertaining anymore. It's just having people in your home, sharing some food, sharing some great conversation. It's the best thing that we do. And we need it so badly right now that I wanted to share three of my favorite recipes so that even though you were cooking three meals a day, these are new things for your repertoire. And I think that's always a good thing to do and to look for. But do not try and do what we're doing tonight on your own. <laughs> I've made these recipes several times. Doing three recipes in a little over an hour is really tough because they all require being in the oven at some point. So we're gonna get started very soon. But take a Sunday afternoon and make recipes and use them during the week. All of these recipes do very well for le as leftovers. Um, I'd say the fish is probably the one that I would, less, I would use less in that way because fish is always best when it's first cooked fresh. But even that would spend, you could have it an extra night. Um, so with that, I'm just going to mention for any of you who, um, who's cooking along with the chicken recipe, you could just raise your hands. Jean's going to kind of take a look there. Um, as Jean said, we're going to take questions after the recipes, but if you're in the middle of a recipe, you know, unmute yourself and ask the question because I don't want you to be stuck. Yes, um, you all have the ability to unmute yourself. So you can just tell Connie. 
So let me mention, if you're cooking the chicken, start cooking, start breaking up, uh, excuse me, cutting up the chicken breasts, if you haven't already done that, into two inch pieces. Two inches is about the size of your thumb. And that's not too small so that it's going to overcook quickly. It's just the right size for about a bite and a half, probably. You, you need a knife and fork to cut it. Um, although this chicken is so moist when you make it, you won't even need that. Uh, so does anybody need to cut up their chicken? Is everybody sort of ready on that? I'm gonna ask that every once in a while. And if you're not, and you need more time, just unmute and say, need more time. Um, but I'm gonna assume that you're ready. And I'm gonna say, I'll just suggest that my oven just went to time. So it's at temperature. And that's a good sound to hear. We're going to start with chicken breasts, but what I'm gonna do first, and I'm actually, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna turn, if you look at the other side of the screen, you've got my cooktop. I've melted some butter and I'm making the full recipe today because even though there's only two of us at home, I love this recipe as a leftover. So I'm gonna be I'm making the full recipe. So four or five half chicken breasts cut into two inch pieces. Um, the recipe says melt some butter. You could split it with oil. If you wanted to do butter and oil, that's great. If you want to make it a little bit heart healthy, you know, the fat is the same in terms of calories, butter and oil, but the difference is saturated fats are in butter. So if you're concerned about that, use half and half, but don't kick, don't miss some of the butter. It does have more flavor than the olive oil. Um, so I've got my butter melted here. I'm taking chicken and the recipe says, Salt and pepper and paprika, the chicken. This is the use of, of, of paprika as a verb, to paprika. We're not going to be using verbs like that anymore. Um, I do it all at once. So I'm going to throw in, and hopefully you can see me doing this. I'm going to toss in some chicken. And I'm going to do about half of the recipe will fit in my, my little pot. You can be doing this in a saute pan as well. And what I'm going to do is actually put in the um salt pepper and paprika right now so hopefully you can see me doing that can you see this i'm not sure my camera yeah okay you can good so we're going to put in the salt and pepper i've got paprika here i'm just going to sprinkle it in what this paprika does as well as having some great flavor it gives it a really lovely color so we're just basically going for a little bit of cooking. We're not going to cook it through. We're just going to um, get some color on it and make sure that it's somewhat brown. I'm going to put my heat up a little higher here. And it always, you know, it takes, I'd say about four to five minutes to do this step. So while I'm waiting for those to get a little color, I'm going to talk about the other ingredients. Um, we are using artichoke hearts. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about artichoke hearts. I have to, I love Trader Joe's, so don't, this is not a negative on Trader Joe's. I don't know if you can see that. And this one is a Cento brand, which is just at every grocery store. I love Trader Joe's, but today I looked at the sodium content. The Trader Joe's sodium per serving, which is a half cup, is 480, excuse me, yeah, 480 milligrams of sodium for a half cup. The Cento is 40. So, Next time I'm gonna use the Cento, and I really encourage you to think about adding salt when you want to, not when the store, you know, when the uh, manufacturer decides you should. But artichoke hearts also come in whole, whole, um, whole heart or quartered. I guess I have, yeah, these are quartered. The quartered's just easier, but it's easy to quarter them as well when you need to, so. Okay, take a look back here. Starting to get just a little color here. That's what we're looking for. And what you want to have next to you, by the way, when you're making this is a baking dish, like so, baking dish. This is probably a, it's not a nine by 12, but it's close. It's a something or other. Of course, it's going to tell me it's a quart. Never mind. It's in quarts. Um, when we finish cooking the chicken, um, we're going to put it right into the, the dish, right into the casserole dish. So this is getting close, but we're going to just get every piece of it. I don't want to see paint is what I'm looking for. And I think I need a different tool here. There we go. 
you probably can't hear the sizzle because I don't I don't have the audio on, so that would cause a, a, a feedback. But that's getting really close. I'm going to give it a couple more minutes, and I'm going to talk to you about the other ingredients. So we're using mushrooms as well, and mushrooms um, large size is fine. I cut them in quarters. You can use the small little button ones and use them in half, whatever size you like. The idea is not to have this be mushy. It's to have some substance, some texture to the dish. So I'm just going to cut these in, um, in quarters and put them into the dish. And I'll just show you this is what's going to be what we use later in a minute. And here are the artichoke hearts. I love artichoke hearts. And I'll just show you. I cut them all in advance. and But if you buy them quartered, that's even easier. And I'm going to turn around and take that chicken off the, the uh, stove right now because it's ready. So this is what we're looking for. We're looking for just a little bit of color so that we don't see pins. So I'm gonna take that out, put it in my casserole baking dish. And if there's any point where you can't see the screen, let me know. For some reason, my, uh, I believe you can see it, but Jean will tell me it's not and I can readjust things. All right, so that's the first batch. We're gonna put the second batch in. And I'm going to talk to you about one more ingredient. First, I'm going to put salt, pepper, and paprika on these. And again, I try not to put too much salt, but you do need to have some flavor. You want to make sure that you've... Uh, You don't want your company to say, oh, it's well, it looks lovely, but you need a little salt. All right. So I'm just going to turn these around and let them sit for a little while. And I am going to talk to you about the last of the, of the unique ingredients. So the recipe calls for sherry. You can use white wine. You can use whatever wine that you like to eat, to drink. But please don't use cooking wine. It's just not a great quality of wine. Use something, buy yourself a bottle of wine and use some of it for your cooking. Um, I keep sherry in the house. Um, it's like those, those little ladies with the sherry glasses in the afternoon on a Sunday. I don't do that. But the reason I like uh, the flavor of sherry is so much richer than just a glass of white wine, a, a, you know, a white wine to use in the recipe. So this is dry sherry. Sherry comes cream sherry, which is the sweet stuff and dry sherry buy yourself a bottle. It's a fortified wine, so it's higher in alcohol, but it lasts forever. So I bought this in July is when I opened it. And it's going to sit in my cupboard, although it's about a quarter finished because I make this recipe a bit. Um, you're going to use it for a year and it's going to be just fine. So don't, uh, don't think you're wasting by using, buying yourself a bottle of sherry for cooking. So, okay. Connie, I'm just letting you know the stove top is very clear and I can see you, although your kitchen is... is um, you, I see the kitchen is blurry. Yeah, that's what yeah that's. I can see you, but not the backdrop. Yeah, I think that's what Spotlight does now. I realize that. Yeah, the Spotlight does that. Yeah, it and used I, to be that you can see everything even with Spotlight, but for some reason, that's not the case anymore. So. And I've also asked people, they can put questions in the chat box um, and I'll pose them to you at the end about this particular dish. Right. Or if they're cooking... Um, you can, everyone has the ability to unmute themselves and interrupt with a question as you cook along if Great. they're making the dish. Thank you, Jean. That's good. So what we're going to do once we finish this chicken is we're going to move on to the mushrooms. We're going to add just a teensy bit more butter and we're going to saute the mushrooms about three minutes. And what we're going to do after that is made what's called a roux. And a roux is basically flour and some sort of fat like butter in most instances. And it's just to thicken the sauce that we that we make um, along the way. So once the chicken is in there, uh, in the in the cooking in the baking dish, I'm going to take the, the artichoke hearts and put them around the uh, chicken. And I'll I'll show you that in a minute. Actually, I'll do that now to some degree. I'll put some of them. I'll put some of them in right now. And then we'll wait for the rest of the chicken, and we'll put the rest in there. And the second batch of chicken is almost ready. So again, you're not fully cooking, you're just making this partially a little brown, and then it's going to continue to cook in the oven. I'm going to let that sit for just a little bit more. And uh, let's see what else I have. Okay, so I'm going to get the other piece, the other uh, bit of butter ready for the mushrooms. 
Excuse me, Connie, but Ann wants to know if you're using garlic. I'm not. Okay. No garlic in this recipe. I love garlic, but there's no, I don't think there's garlic in any of the recipes I'm making tonight, which is very unheard of. You know, I used to teach cook classes, cooking classes at the Council on Aging. And I, for some reason, one day I decided to like garlic up everybody. And two of the recipes I made, I recall, were, were loaded with garlic. And one of the ladies whispered and said to her friend, she really loves that garlic, doesn't she? So I thought, okay, I'm going to not necessarily do garlic for everybody. Hey, you know what? Not one of these recipes has garlic. That's very unusual. I'm Greek and we love garlic, but that's a, that's a general statement, I know. Connie, I just okay. want to pose one question in the middle from Mary. She said, my daughter is gluten intolerant. Can I make a roux with the alternative flour? Absolutely, yes. That's a very good question. Absolutely. Okay, so I am going to take these other, others out. Again, they're not cooked. Remember that. Don't be worried that they're not cooked. And what I'm going to do, I actually have quite a bit of butter in the pan already. So I'm going, I'm going to just add the mushrooms to it. So I'm going to take these mushrooms and they're going right into the pan. And we're going to let them uh, cook down a little bit, just basically till they get soft. And you can base, you can um, um, break it, well, you know, test it with a fork and it'll be nice and soft. So, you know, I am going to add a little butter just because I want this to have a rich sauce. You're using chicken, so you can feel like, okay, I can use some butter in there. I'm going to put a little of the butter here that I didn't use before. I make sure my phone doesn't melt. My phone is, you know, zooming with the, my phone is the cooktop here. And I, I thought as I was setting this up, I hope it doesn't melt. Mm -hmm. That'd be a problem. So I like a lot of mushrooms. I would probably add more mushrooms to this recipe, but I was showing you the way it's, you know, original. Oh, and I should mention, these recipes are not recipes I created. I don't believe there is an original recipe. I think every recipe is something that someone got and tweaked. So these recipes, this particular recipe, chicken and artichokes, I've had this for at least 25 years. And I bring it out whenever I want to make dinner for my family or for, I want to bring to somebody's house. Um, it's great if you want to be able to give something, you know, a casserole to somebody, but it's not like a, you know, a typical casserole. It's really something that's quick. You're going to see how fast this is. Uh, and, and it really has a lovely flavor. So I find that um, it's a very, very simple recipe, but it's again, not my own. It's one that I've, I'm sure I've tweaked it over the years and, you know, added or, or subtracted something. So, okay. Uh, I'm going to finish up with these artichoke parts. I don't know that you can see that. Maybe you can at the edge of the, uh, edge of the picture. Okay. These mushrooms look good. They look perfect actually. So what I'm going to do now is add the flour. And you're following along, so it's uh, two tablespoons of flour. And you definitely want to cook this flour. You don't want to just add your liquid right away. You want to make sure that you cook the flour. There's nothing worse than raw flour. Um, so get it nicely goopy. It's very thick and very goopy, as you'll see. And now the, the next thing we do is we add the liquids. So I, it says to add the broth and the sherry at the same time. I add the sherry first because I like the sherry to um, just take a smell over your pot. Oh, it's wonderful. Um, I want the sherry to kind of, I want the alcohol to burn off a little bit. What happens with alcohol when you cook it is the alcohol burns off in the heat and then what's left is the sweetness of the, of the sherry. The, you know, the grapes that went into it provide that sweetness. So that's in there now. I'm going to add the chicken broth. I'm going to let that just kind of cook together. And uh, I was watching a um, Jacques Pepin video the other day. I'm a big fan of Jacques Pepin. So he was one of our instructors, as, I, as, as Jean said. I went to BU to, to cooking school. 
Um, and he was wondering, I'm going to add a little bit more sauce here, but a little bit more chicken broth, just because I think it needs a little more. You can get, you'll get a sense of how things look and taste and all that, but I'm going to add just a little more chicken broth. Um, Jack Pepin yesterday was doing something, I don't know what it was, and he reminded me as he was cooking of my mother. And <laughs> doesn't look anything like her, but he would do this, and we've all done this. Right? <laughs> It's like, I think I'm breaking my, my equipment or the pan, one or the other, either the spoon or the pan. So I'm going to try and get this to boil. That's what we're looking for. And once it gets a little bubbly, we're going to put it on top of the chicken and the artichoke hearts. And then we tuck it in the oven for 30 minutes at 375. And then we're going to move on to number two recipe is, I think it is the fish. So yeah. those of you who are going to be cooking with fish, you can start getting your, uh, your ingredients ready. And I'm just waiting for this uh, chicken sauce to get, you know what, we could take a, any questions now on the recipe, Jean, that would work if there are any, I don't know if there are yet. Okay. Well, so we don't have anything in the chat box except, um, let's see here, Jana and Mike shared that they made our, their chicken recipe tonight with gluten-free flour. And um, Mary read that, which was good. Great. And, um, we don't really have any others in the chat, but anybody who's speaking or would like to ask a question, you can just unmute yourself and, and ask, okay? That's great. Okay. I, you know what, what I'm gonna do in the meantime is talk to you about what you could serve with that. So I have these little packets of steamable rices. I go to Wegmans as well. And these are 90 second rice. Um, I know it sounds crazy and it's, you know, it's, it's pre-cooked obviously. I have one that's um, uh, jasmine rice. And this is a whole grain brown rice from Uncle Ben's. So I, what I'll do is I will make these and you know serve it underneath because it's a great sauce and you're going to want something underneath it. Uh, and, and it's a very quick way to get some rice into the menu as well. So, okay. Connie, Connie excuse me. I think that Janet and Mike have um, something they want to share. Okay. Yeah. So, well, we demuted. We did make the, the chicken dish. Um, we're celebrating Mike's birthday. Um, it turned out well. We made rice on the side, just as you suggested. We also made some asparagus and green beans because we had them in the fridge. Perfect. So nice. <laughs> Happy birthday, Mike. Happy birthday, Mike. <laughs> Good. All right. So I am pouring. I'm not going to show you where I'm chill. I'll show you as I bring it over. I'm pouring the sauce in. Honey, yes. Ronan has a, a question for you. Yes, Ronan. I can make it. I can make my own ice cream sandwiches with my dad and mom. Oh, Whoa. more ice of a comment than a question. Oh, okay. He so makes his own ice cream sandwiches. Ronan, next time you're going to be cooking on this show, okay? Okay. All right, buddy. <laughs> you have to get an apron. Yeah. You have to get an apron. You're right. So I'm going to just show you. I don't know if you can see that now that I say this. Uh, you can't. Uh, we can see it there. Oh, oh, well, nope. you're right. it's, it might be the spotlight. Connie, I think it's the spotlight. Is that right there? Can you see it? Yes. yes. Right there. So yes. that's what it looks like. It's going in the oven. It's very hot. So I'm going to put it in the oven and it's going to go for 30 minutes. Beautiful. Now, Connie, uh, Rose has a, um, a question. Does, yes. do, do you mix the two rices together to serve? Oh, you know what? You can. It doesn't matter. I just like, you know, it's just the two of us. So I would probably just use one of them. But um, it's definitely, you know, either or. I, you know, I like brown rice. And if you mix jasmine with it, that's fine, too. Brown rice is a little healthier for us. But who cares, right? Right. <laughs> uh, I'm going to put my timer on, folks, because I have to remember probably when this is ready. And... Got my light in the way here, so I can't do that. Okay, all right, that is in the oven. Okay, we're gonna move on to recipe number two, which is the fish. So, with herb to bread comes here. Okay, so this is one of those dishes that is, um, I've made it for friends who love to cook. You know, you know, you know when you have people who are really good cooks, and you say, "Ooh, I don't know if I want to invite them for dinner," because you know, how am I ever gonna? It's, I'll tell you actually a real story. Chris Douglas, who used to own the, the Ashmont Grill. We, we used to go to the Ashmont Grill all the time. So I got to know him. And he said, nobody ever invites me to dinner because I'm a chef. 
And I said, well, you know, you have to just make them comfortable and tell them, you know, make whatever you want. And it'll be great because I love to, you know, eat at people's houses as well. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. I'll try that. But what happens is um, I invited a friend who's a very, very good cook. And I thought I got to really wow her with something. And I thought, and she loves fish. And so I made this fish dish and I can't, you know, wow sounds funny to say about just scrod, which is nothing fancy, but it's a really elegant looking dish. And it's a lovely combination of flavors, I think. So we're gonna make this and we're gonna start with, um, again, melting butter. We, uh, I need to see where I put these items in the, okay, hold on, fish. When you're doing three recipes, you need to have them all prepared. So this is my, my preparation here. Um, we're gonna start with butter, two tablespoons of butter and some shallots. So let me get my fish pan ready here. Oh, I love, by the way, I love, love, love um, cast iron pans. I hardly ever use anything else but cast iron now. And I would highly recommend that you do, if anybody has questions on how to use a cast iron pan, because I was, I was worried about it. I thought, oh my gosh, it's, you know, you have to take care of it. You have to season it, season it, so to speak. Um, but it is just so easy to use. And it's really easy to clean. You just have to make sure you do it from the beginning, that you start the process out and you continue to do it every time you use it. So um, I am going to take the butter. So this is, I think, a half a recipe. I am making a half a recipe of this one. So a quarter cup is four tablespoons of butter. I'm using two tablespoons. And I've got one large shallot right here, which is going to go in. And basically what we're doing with this fish is making the stuffing and that's it. You know, I bought haddock actually because it was, it was great. It looked beautiful. And I thought I'm going to get that. You could use cod, haddock, you could use swordfish. You could use anything. I like using the lighter fish because it's um, a little bit easier to uh, stuff it. You know, it, it really, the, 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 the texture is a little bit nicer when you've got a, a, scot, a scrot or a cod or a uh, haddock, you know what, uh, scrot and cod as we know is the same thing. But anyway, um, but I will talk about as that's melting and the shallots are cooking, and I think they cook for about a minute, so not a lot. The breadcrumbs, so these are my breadcrumbs. Feel free to use whatever breadcrumbs you have dry. I try and buy unseasoned breadcrumbs because I, again, once again, I want to add the seasoning to it. These are, I went to Trader Joe's and I bought their um, Tuscan bread and I took four or five slices, took the crust off and I use my, I have to show you my little tool here, which I love. And this is my mini Cuisinart chopper. Oh gosh. In front of you, there yep. I got it. Yeah, there right go. there. Yep. Um, and it is like magic. So I have that to make my breadcrumbs. I buy breadcrumbs too, but I love the fact that I can make fresh ones very easily. So, all right, let's get these. Just your shallots are just, and you know, in a pinch, just use onion if you don't have shallots. But this, you know, this, I was going for the full effect of this recipe for my friend who's a really good cook. <laughs> so, all right. So that's the butter. That's, and we're adding in, excuse me, the shallots are there. We're adding in the crumbs just so that the crumbs get nice and buttery. So, so just, Connie, do you generally cook with butter? You know what? I do. I used to, but all of these recipes can be used with just olive oil. I, my sister-in-law is a heart surgeon. And so she knows the uh, effects of poor eating and um, genetics and all the things that can cause people to have heart issues. You know, excessive amounts of butter probably are on that list as well. But if you're using, I mean, this is a recipe, the chicken, I used, I think five tablespoons of butter, but you can use like half and half it with, um, hold on one second, I'm just gonna make sure I'm doing this. I'm gonna take that and remove it from the heat and add the chives, the parsley and the lemon peel. Let me just make sure this is done. Um, I basically feel like it's, uh, it's okay to use butter. She says it is, she uses it, but in moderation. So that recipe for chicken, five tablespoons for four, five, it was five chicken breast halves. So that's per 
per person per serving, really small amount. So I don't worry about it that way. Okay, we're gonna add some, um, let's see here. I've got parsley that's chopped. I've got chives that come in this nice little container here. I think there you go. And I've got chives, so I'm gonna add parsley, chives, and lemon peel. So I'm gonna talk to you, oh, off the heat. We're basically done with the heat at this point. And I'm gonna mix those around and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about lemon peel. So um, get yourself, I'm a gadget girl, get yourself a microplane grater. And it is a great thing to have, not just for lemon, which I do well. So when you're zesting a lemon, by the way, the easiest way to do it is to have the zester opening up so that you're collecting things in here and you can see what you have. Okay, and you'll be able to see, although the spotlight doesn't let you see very well, but it's in there. And then you, again, like a Jacques Papin, you have to make sure it's uh, out. So lemon zest is one of those things that it really, it's got the oils of the lemon as well as just this great flavor. So it's a, it's a real, if you want to get a pop of lemon, more than even lemon juice would be, is it's to use lemon zest. Okay. So that is the stuffing. I'm going to take out my fish and show you what I have. So good that I have my sink right next to me because everything's ending up there. Connie, excuse me. Uh, Craig has a question. Do you have to dry the bread for making the breadcrumbs? Uh, no, I did not do anything to it. I, it was fresh bread. I bought it like really fresh and it was fine just as is. That's a really good question though. So I'm going to flip my um, laptop down so you can see the beautiful piece of fish I have here. Maybe. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, there you go. Gosh. There you go. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So Julia okay. Child always used a butter as the base of her recipes. I read my favorite book was My Life in France by Julia Child. Yes. And um, everything was butter base and it was the flavor. It's the wonderful She's, flavor. She was amazing. You know, like I'm loving, I, I was fortunate enough to cook with her at BU where I went to school, she and Gordon Hammersley came in one day and they cooked with us. Uh, she didn't do a lot of cooking. She was kind of sitting in her, in her walker, but she was just amazing. Um, and she said, she talked about that. She said, don't be afraid of butter. It gives you the best flavor, but just use it in moderation. And I, I had a father who was, a, 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 he owned a little restaurant in Brockton and his favorite word was moderation, everything in moderation. Don't deny yourself something that is really good and, and just enjoy it, but enjoy it in, in, in um, small portions. So I started with some butter on the pan. I put olive oil, excuse me, I put, put aluminum foil and rubbed a little bit of butter. Once again, use olive oil instead. If you're one of those people who does not wanna use butter, olive oil can be substituting in all of these, but with the chicken, I would have a little bit of butter in that recipe. Um, the next thing we do to prepare this is we basically take a brush and brush the um, lemon juice onto the fish. Now, you do not want to do that too, too soon because lemon juice is acidic and it will end up cooking your fish, you know, like a ceviche. Um, and you're going to end up having very mushy fish, which you do not want to have. So I'm doing half a recipe of this one, as I said. So I've got a little bit less than a pound of fish, which is actually a lot for us. A, a typical portion in a restaurant is probably eight ounces, but the, the preferred healthy portion is about five to six ounces of fish. Um, so this is gonna shrink, all proteins shrink about 20% of the size through cooking. So this is gonna shrink and it's gonna end up to be for us, for two people, it's gonna be like five, five or six ounces, probably five. Um, so I've just brushed that fish. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna come over here and I'm going to not burn my hand. Hold on a moment. And I'm going to put this, the stuffing. I've got to check my recipe though. I don't want to forget something. So hold on a moment. Where am I? I am at the, uh, oh, salt and pepper. Prepare, okay. So salt and pepper. I did not add salt and pepper. I want to be sure I do that with the stuffing. Just a little bit. That's about a quarter teaspoon of, uh, of salt. And uh, about, you know, eighth of a teaspoon of, of pepper. Um, I don't know if you can see me doing that. Not really. Okay. No. So I'm going to mix this up and I'm going to put it right on top of the fish and you'll be able to see it on top of the fish. 
And it just makes a beautiful look. I just have to say the fact that it's, you know, the green of all those gorgeous herbs and the little shallots, it's a really lovely recipe, I have to tell you. I know, you, I know I'm, like, I'm waxing poetically about fish. That's my life. It looks delicious. <laughs> it really is. And I haven't eaten dinner yet, so it's looking even better right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and don't, you know, don't worry. It says to press it down. You know, I made a little, you're going to find that sometimes, depending on the size of the fish, you made too much of this or too little of this, whatever. You want to try these recipes if you can before you invite somebody over. Although I am notoriously known in my family for my brother will come into the house and say, Did you try this recipe, Connie, or were your guinea pigs? You're my guinea pigs usually. Hands are the best way to do this. Just press it down. And that is it, I believe. I'm going to check my recipe. Let's see what it says. Oh, by the way, you can prepare the stuff, the stuffing the day before, which is what I do, or in the morning, the night before, whatever. And then all you have to do is get the fish on there, put the breadcrumb mixture on it and stick it in the oven. Very, very simple recipe. So, okay, that is going in the oven. Now it says 425, but I have only one oven in this condo. I used to have two in my house in Milton, but now I have only one. So I've put the temperature for both of these recipes at 400 to start out. So we're going to uh, get this in the oven right next to the chicken. And it's going to cook for 15 to 20 minutes. So I have about 17 and a half minutes left on the chicken. So I'm going to take them both out and see how they are at the same time. So any questions so far? Um, I have one question in the chat from Craig. What's the difference with shallots and onions? So shallots are just a smaller um, I think more fragrant, that's a word that's often used with food. And I'm, I'm, I, you know, you kind of know what it means. It's a more fragrant, um, delicate flavor than an onion. And so, although I said you could replace it with onion, if you didn't have shallots, shallots are not as overpowering. I find them to be really, really, I'm not a big raw onion fan, but I could eat a raw shallot. <laughs> so it's just a more, it's more fragrant. It's more light. Um, and it's, uh, it just adds to a, a, a recipe, I think gives it a nice flavor. So that's not a very technical term, Craig, I'm sorry. Um, okay. but good. That sounds like a good answer. So, uh, Shannon has her hand up and Shannon, I am going to un, uh, um, uh, let's see. If I can... Shannon can you... and that's Maris with Shannon. Oh, okay. Can you, Connie. yeah, there you go. Good. Connie, I was wondering if you use salted or unsalted butter. Oh, good question. Always unsalted butter. Okay. Because once again, I want to add salt when I want to. Um, there are some recipes that, you know, people suggest it's just so much better to use salted butter. And I get that. But for me, I'd rather add the salt and know, know what I'm doing as opposed to getting some. I haven't bought salted butter in 20 years. <laughs> so I always use unsalted. So I don't know, Shannon, would your kids, do your kids eat fish? Maybe not. Um, no, I mean, sometimes they'll get like fish and chips down the cave. And sometimes that's eating Look at that face. Okay, that's Keating, right? Is that Keating giving me the thumbs down? Zoe said no. Keating oh, Zoe. Is that Zoe? I can't see. It's right next to your name. Oh, well, sorry, guys. <laughs> so was that another question there? Um, no. Okay. All right. So we have two things in the oven. I'm going to put the pan away and um, get that next pan ready for the pork. And all right. Now, so um, just a minute for me to get things a little bit better organized here. And I'm going to move on to the pork tenderloin. Now the pork tenderloin recipe is wonderful for this time of year because it has fall flavors to it. It's got apples in it, first of all, which I would use any time of year, but it's nice to have it at this time of year in particular. Um, so I've got a, uh, let's see here, where I'm gonna, I'm gonna move that. I was having this kitchen where I can sort of go like this and like this, it's sort of that big and I can get to everything that I need to. Um, I'm gonna get my chicken broth. You know, one thing I didn't talk to you about chicken broth as well. So chicken broth is one of those things that I watch as well in terms of, um, 
the salt, the sodium content. I hate to keep talking about salt, but salt is one of those things that's just not, it's, it's almost worse for you than butter. It's definitely worse for, than you, for, for you than butter because we eat so much salt and we don't know how much we're eating because it's in everything. Um, this sodium is 140 milligrams per cup. And that's really good. Um, you don't want to go much below that. I've bought some that have been like 50 milligrams. They have no salt, no flavor, but this is, um, not, this is um, Wegmans brand, but Pacific brand is a good one as well. Um, and most of them that I buy, I really do look at to see that they're somewhere under 200 milligrams per, per cup of uh, sodium. So, um, okay. So I'm going to bring over the next recipe, which is the pork, as I said. And um, this recipe is just with oil. So I'm using grapeseed oil. Um, people talk about canola oil. When, when, when I see a recipe that says vegetable oil, I basically put grapeseed oil in because it has no flavor. Um, I don't know what canola oil is. I know that sounds funny, but it's to me, it's, it's kind of a, a name that I think has been a, a sort of a marketing name. So I don't really understand what it is. So I, I like to buy grapeseed oil because that just determines in my head that I know what it is. Um, and we're using fresh herbs, but you don't have to. I've got fresh thyme here just because I found it. And I, you know, sometimes the grocery stores don't have it, but they do, they did right now. So we're going to use fresh thyme. We're using Dijon mustard. And we do have a little bit of butter, I think, in this recipe as well. Boy, you know, every recipe, I miss the garlic and everything is butter. Wow, that's that tells you where I am right now, I guess. Wow. Um, okay, so I'm going to start by talking about the tenderloin itself. I am one of those people who does like pork. I know a lot of people don't, but I think pork doesn't have a huge flavor on its own, but it takes on sort of like chicken in that regard. Uh, it takes on the flavor of whatever you're making. So this is a pork tenderloin, and I'm going to I'm going to put it on my board, and I'm going to drop the. Let's see if you can see it. This whole spotlight thing kind of got me thrown here. I didn't realize that you wouldn't be able to see my board. Oh yeah, not really. Huh? It's a little. You can, if you lift it up, you can see it, Connie. Yeah. Like halfway between you and the screen. Yeah, there you go. Um, uh, right there. There right you there. go. Okay. That's okay. okay. So that's about a pound and a quarter tenderloin. And you'll notice that it has this, um, oh boy, sorry folks. I gotta get it right at the right moment here and it's not yeah. easy to see. Yeah. Okay, we won't worry about that. Um, I'm gonna bring it over to the other screen, but right now what I'm gonna do is show you, actually I will show you under the other screen. I think this one you can see better. Can you see that a little better? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. I'm gonna put that right on here. It won't melt my, my, cut, my cutting board hopefully. So you can see it's got these tendons here where the, the tenderloin was connected to the rest of the animal. I hate to say that, but it is an animal. Um, and I'm going to just cut some of that, that tendon kind of uh, texture off of this because it's really, you, you don't have to go crazy. And, and I you know, would never say to you like, get it all off because that's crazy. But I do try and take some of this stuff off it's a very tender meat. It's very, very lean. And can you see me doing things with this? Yes, yeah. yes. So I just take off some of these things and you can see that piece right there is the piece that's gonna be a little bit tough. So I'm gonna just stick my sharp knife in there and get rid of it if I can. And sometimes you take some of the meat with you, that's okay. Um, so one of these pork tenderloins, as I said, is about uh, a pound and a quarter. And I'm making this for two of us. And so it's a half a recipe. The recipe calls for four because if you're making it for a group, you'd, um, you know, you'd want to have two of these. Um, and usually three people can eat out of a tenderloin if they have normal appetites. If they're big eaters, two people would probably eat this. And uh, But Jean and I basically split one of these and we have leftovers. I love pork tenderloin sandwiches. I know that sounds crazy, but I love them. So that's the fat that I took off. I'm not going to go crazy though. It's just that I wanted to be sure that it didn't have some of that um, tough um, kind of stuff. So technical term kind of stuff, you know what I mean? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of, uh, I think this is the one where I put the olive oil and some salt. Yes. So I'm going to talk, uh, not olive oil, it's the uh, the uh, grapeseed oil, the grapeseed oil. Okay, I'm just gonna use my hands 
And I'm just gonna put some of uh, this grapeseed oil in my hand and I'm gonna just rub it on there and, and just get that little piece, which somehow got, I separated it. And I'm gonna put some salt as well. I'm gonna swing that around and put a little bit on the other side. Okay. Wash my hands here. And the next thing I'm going to do is warm up my, I should have started this beforehand, but I was using this burner here. I'm going to get my, uh, my big cast iron. I want, a, I want a second cast iron here, and it's the 12 inch one. <laughs> I realized that if I want to cook more than just for two people, I needed the 12 inch one. So the trick with cast iron and searing meats is getting the pan hot. And you get the pan, what's nice about a cast iron is that you don't have to have any oil in there when you're heating it. Where with a regular like non-stick pan, you should put oil in because you can burn the surface of the pan without anything in it. But with this pan, you can just basically let it sit without um, anything in it. And that's what I'm doing. Um, and we're gonna basically heat about, um, let's see here, a tablespoon of oil and uh, sear the meat, but I'm gonna wait until that gets really hot. Okay, uh, excuse me, Connie, yes. one quick question. Yes. I wants to know, can you use olive oil for this or does that have yes. too much flavor? No, you can, you can, this is pretty flavorful. I was just interested in trying different things. So I, I got started using vegetable oil for this, but yes, definitely olive oil is fine. You don't have to go out and buy a new one. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, and one of the things I wanna say about olive oils, and I know I've mentioned this to people I've taught, I've uh, worked with before, there are two kinds of olive oils. There's the kind of olive oil you cook with, and there's the kind of olive oil you want to use in a salad dressing, and they're very different. So um, make sure that you um, don't spend a lot of money on the one that you're going to cook with. Buy that. I like California, which is the one I buy. I'm going to just show you. It's pretty obvious. I'm sure everybody knows this brand, California olive oil. It's simple. It's made here in the U.S., which is fine. But you know, you have to watch some of the other olive oils and make sure they're not. You know, if you're thinking you're buying Italian olive oil, you want to make sure it says it's from Italy. So I buy this other stuff. I make salad dressings myself, and I love this other stuff, which I bought at Craft and Crew. Um, Jean Paul scored me this, and he said it's one of the best. It's called uh, Guerrera, Guerreri, and it's delicious. But you don't want to cook with it. It's wasting a very expensive olive oil on cooking. You want to use something like the uh, California one. And then use this for when you make salad dressings. Or you know, at the end of any of you watch Lydia Bastianich, at the end of her cooking demonstrations, she basically does one of these like swirl of olive oil before she dives into the pasta and takes this humongous fork full of pasta. I love that woman. She knows how to enjoy eating. She and Ina Garten, they're my two favorite cooks. Okay, this is nice and hot. We're gonna put a little bit of oil in here and we're gonna get the pan, it's gonna sizzle. I hope it doesn't like break my phone. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Whew, that was great. I just like gave a little, uh, almost gave a, gave myself a shower with, uh, with vegetable oil. Um, in the meantime, get a couple of other things ready while that's searing. You wanna make number, if you're following along, number six is when we start with apples and onions. So I've already cut some of the onions. I took a whole onion. And um, again, I'm gonna try one more time to see if you can see this. No. Sorry, folks, we're gonna figure this out the next time we do one of these, because that's really crazy that you can't see my, my um Do, do you want me to take the spotlight off you and see if we can see a little better? No, you wanna try? Uh... I can try that. Let's see. I don't know what happens then. People won't be able to they'll have to find me, I think, then. Unless I'm talking, though, that wouldn't hurt. Oh, okay. yeah. But I think it'll be harder yeah. to see you, though. So it's probably better to keep you spotlighted. That's all right. I'll show you in the other pan, the other, um, the cooktop version. All right. So I'll show you the onions I have here. And I'm going to then basically, oh, so I've just taken onions just and I've uh, cut them into slices. Small slices, just taking, I took the onion, peeled it, cut it in half, and then just sliced it. So it's pretty basic. Uh, so take a, an apple, and oh, I love this, uh, this tool right here. 
All right, Connie, I'm just trying to, I'm oh, sorry, thanks. I took off the spotlight. I'm trying to put it back on. Oh my gosh, it's in the wrong. It's okay, there we go. Okay, there we go. It's very hard to figure out which direction to go in here. Oh yeah. gosh. <laughs> there we go. It's a uh, an apple core. And it's the kind that what happens is when you, I'll show you, you go and you poke it into the apple. I'm going to turn my pork around in a minute here though. Hold on one second. Oh, this is going to be perfect. Wait till you see how nice and brown that is. That's what you're looking for. Okay, you put it into your apple, and it goes all the way through, and you take the apple out, the core out, and it's in here now. It's like the best tool. I love it. Cool. I do get pretty excited about silly things right now. Yeah. Um, and then I'm going to no peeling. I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just going to slice it, and I'll show you these slices on the other screen in a minute. And you want to get this all ready so that when you're ready to swap out, we're going to take the pork out and we're going to cook the apples. And then we're going to, uh, the apples and the onions. This makes like a, um, it's, at the end, you're going to look at it, and, it's, and if you make it, you'll see it's like a, um, like a chutney almost. It's just, it's a really good flavor. So I'm going to grab a bowl for those. And, and then I'll show you the size of those. They're about they're probably the same similar size to the onions. So those are the apples. There we go. So I have my apple and onions ready to go. I'm going to flip this fork over to the other side. You want it to be brown. And I would normally put my my vent on here, but it's going to make too much noise and you won't be able to see anything. Oh, actually, maybe I can. I don't think you'll be able to see it. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I'm going to look at the next step here. So um, let me look at what we have left. We have two minutes left on the chicken and the fish, and we're going to need to um, put this in the oven. And I don't know that I have room for it. So I'm going to take a deep break now. Oh yeah, chicken's getting ready. I'll be able to take that chicken out. Okay, so um, what the next step is, I'm going to take out the pork and put it on the side. And then I'm going to put the apples and onions in and cook them a little bit. And uh, well, then we'll add in some thyme. And I buy fresh thyme, as I said, but you can definitely use um, dry thyme. The, ra the ratio is one tablespoon fresh is equal to about one teaspoon dry. And I get, you know, I've got great little dry as well, which is, is good to eat. Okay, so one more turn on this and I'm gonna say it's ready to put in full of fry. So this is when you see this little piece right here. This is when off camera, I, I have to take a bite of that. It's like not the research, you have to be sure it's healthy. And, but it's not quite good yet. Yeah. All right, so uh, I'm gonna get a dish ready for that. Okay. We're almost at the one hour mark, folks. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Um, Okay, any questions about anything? I can take a break right now, if that helps. Anybody have any questions? Honey, when you make your Christmas list, does it have like all kitchen utensils on it? Do they have what? Does all have what? Ki kitchen utensils. Oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Oh, I mean, that's, that's my favorite thing to do is, you know, I bought myself a uh, stand mixer last year for Christmas. It's like, well, you know. And Jean's always saying, you really want that for Christmas? It's like, yeah, I want it. Sure, I do. Absolutely. So I want to also mention, if you look at number seven, you can get that ready as well. Mix up some mustard, thyme, and black pepper. And I did that here. I just used regular Dijon mustard, a little bit of thyme, fresh thyme, and some black pepper. And when the pork is ready to go back out, hold on one second, I'm going to stop my, uh... okay. I'm going to shut off my pork um, because that's going to come out. We're going to put that pork on a plate and I'm going to set it aside. And while the apples and onions are cooking, 
we will smear that pork with some mustard and the, the mixture, the mustard, uh, pepper, and uh, thyme or uh, um, spread. So this is coming out of the pan onto a plate. I'm going to cover it over and we'll let it sit aside here and just hang out. It is not cooked fully through by any means, but you also don't worry about um, over, don't under, don't worry about undercooking pork, I should say. Don't overcook pork. I grew up in a time when you had to worry about pork. It had to be brown on the inside. No longer the case. You can definitely use a, a thermometer, a meat thermometer, and buy one of these. It's great. It's a thermo pen. It's an immediate read meat thermometer. And um, you can, that's one of those things I did get for another holiday too, Jean. There you go. So, yeah. you know, oh, I want a meat thermometer, honey. So, um, okay. So I'm going to put back the pan. I'm going to put the um, onions and apples in. I'm just looking at number six. It says if you need more oil, take a look, but I'm going to try without. I'm going to put these in. They're going to sizzle again because this is a hot pan. I'm going to put the apples in. So what, can I just ask, what's the difference with pork from when you were a kid to now? Will you oh, now? So in the, the, the way pork was processed in the early days, there were cases of unsafe. You had to, you had to cook it so long because the, the conditions under which they slaughtered the pigs was not um, sanitary, serve safe. Oh, you know, it wasn't, oh. it wasn't food. The food FDA wasn't all over it. Um, uh -huh. So now there's so many other um requirements that you don't have to worry about. You know, everything, everything's in a much better state. So I can see this needs a little bit more oil. It's very dry because the pork probably absorbed it. So I'm going to put a little more oil. I'm going to lower the heat a bit. And I'm going to take out my chicken. Um, one question. This is from Craig again. You can tell he's making the pork right now. How high do you cook the apples and onions? How high? Yeah, high temperature. Like yeah, onion. so it is about medium, about medium, I'd say. Okay. You Thank want you. them to get nicely cooked and okay. soft. Thank you. All right, I'm going to grab my mix here and I'm going to take this out and see how the fish is. I think the fish is cooked as well. Just have to show you the fish, folks. Oh, wow, it's delicious. Really see it. The lighting is not great. There it no, is. It looks that's good. Yeah, it looks it's good. beautiful. It's a beautiful yeah. fish. Lovely. Uh, Janet and Mike say, "Have to run." Connie, you're fantastic. <laughs> hey, what? I'm sorry, I couldn't that hear. Was, it. That was Janet and Mike. They sent a message. Have to run, Connie. You're fantastic. Oh, thanks, Janet. Thank you. Happy birthday, Mike. Yep, happy birthday, Mike. <laughs> All right. I'm going to shut off those apples and onions. So they are um, nicely cooked. I'm going to put in here some thyme. And what I'm going to do is just basically take thyme leaves. I don't know if you know this, but it's pretty easy to uh, take thyme leaves and just take them off the stem. You, you, you have them face up and grab the top of the stem and just pull these off. They come right off, or they're supposed to come right off. <laughs> sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Um, Al Ellen, I think. What um, you want to put in, I think uh, it's about a teaspoon or two, whatever. The more time you can put in there, the better. Time is just a wonderful flavor. Um, excuse me, uh, Ellen, this is Ellen Gallagher just shared her screen and it's in the middle of our program. So Ellen, can you please unshare your screen? Um, I'm not Gene, sure. if you co-host me, I might be able to help with that. 
Uh, I'm not I'm sorry. sure. Say that one more time. There we go. Okay, no, we're okay. It came back. Uh, oh, okay. I think we're okay. Is there, is there a question? I think we're okay now. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, somehow a screen. Oh, I see. What brand of sherry? That's for Mary Alice. Great yeah. question, Mary Alice. So I buy, uh, this one is a Barbadillo or Barbadillo. I don't know my, my, my uh, sherry, my porch. This is from Spain. It's a Fino sherry. And I'm sure I bought it uh, like Wegmans or, whoops, right there. No, right there. Um, but any, you know, I've bought Taylor, which is the most common brand that you find. And that's fine as well. It's just, you know, get something that, that you're going to know that you'll enjoy. And, and they're all good. And they're really all good. I just wouldn't get the cheapest thing. But this is about, this one cost, I think the price was on it. It was like eight bucks, nine bucks, something like that. Not, not expensive. You don't need to spend a lot of money on it at all. Okay. So the next thing I need to do is smear my pork. So I'm going to bring the pork back over. And I'm going to smear it with the uh, mustard. And I'm going to read my recipe here. So I am right now at number seven. And you can't see me do this, but I'm going to put it on. It's now, you know, one of the things, this is a very classic way to do pro protein like steaks or lamb or um, pork is you sear it at high heat. So it captures like a little bit of a crust and a little bit of a brownness, but it, it stays moist inside. It's not fully cooked. And then you finish by um, um, putting something on it and roasting it, like a, a schmear of some sort, something that's gonna give it some flavor because it needs flavor. And I use, you know, I use a lot of chutneys on, in cooking and I will take this kind of a recipe and put a chutney on, but you can't put the chutney, uh, it'll burn if you, a sear it with the chutney on it. And if you were gonna roast the pork the whole time and you put chutney on and stuck the roast in the oven, that would burn as well. So the trick is sear it first, put the schmear on and then finish it off in the oven. Is that because the chutney has sugar in it? Is exact one? gene. Are I you know sure what I, you don't I, gene? I, well, I never really cooked that much, Connie, but I did yeah. watch my grandmother and my mother cook for years, so. So it comes through. All, you know, it's, 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 it's in your head, Jean, it's in your head. It's there. <laughs> Okay, so I have now rubbed this mustard on the pork, and I'm going to show you in a second here. And there wasn't a lot of it. It's just a little bit of a schmear. I'll show you that over by the stove. Um, but I'm just going to look and see. Hold on a second here. What's next on my list here? Um, okay, so we're going to put the seared pork over the apples and onions and put it, finish it in the oven, as I suggested. So here's the schmear. It's just a little bit of a schmear on there. Hopefully you can see that. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to take it and I'm going to put it right into the where the and I'm going to take this little piece there just because I think it's such a cute little piece. And I'm going to nestle it under on top of the um, get any juices on top of the apples and onions, get any juices there. And I'm going to stick it in the oven. And this is a heavy pan, so I'm going to do that. And it's going to cook in there for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then we're going to start taking some questions because. If this comes out in 10 minutes, you'll be able to see all three of these. Um, but I'm determined to get you moving on soon. So let me just put this on for 15 minutes. Okay. All right. There is, there is a question here, Connie. Yes. From Rose. Um, I missed what she said about chutney. What kind to get? Oh, so I love, I used to work at Stonewall Kitchen. Um, hold on. Did I forget my, uh, no, no, I was, I'm looking, you know, there's a thing called mise en place, everybody. You take all of your ingredients out and you leave them on the counter. And at the end you say, oh my gosh, I forgot the chicken broth. No, nope, the chicken broth goes in after the pork comes out. So we're good. We're good to go. It is, it is a little scary. Okay. So I used to work at Stonewall Kitchen, not up in Maine. They used to have a store in Chestnut Hill. And I loved that store. Um, it was uh, a great job. You know, I worked in financial services for 25 years. And then I went to cooking school. And I, um, my favorite job was the one I had for three years at Stonewall Kitchen. I loved it. I taught cooking classes there using their products. It was great. So I love their chutneys. And I buy apple cranberry chutney in particular. And you can get it, used to be able to get it at the fruit center. I don't know if they still sell it. The fruit center used to be, 
oh, I think they were in the top 10 sellers of Stonewall Kitchen products. Um, and the, stone, the apple cranberry chutney is fabulous with pork, with chicken. I use it on my sandwiches. If I roast chicken, I'll slice the roast chicken and a schmear of, uh, of apple cranberry chutney on the bread is just a, it's a great combination in chicken salad, whatever. So this is a chutney that we're making. This, I was mentioning chutney because the apples and onions with the thyme together, when we finish this recipe, you're gonna see the chicken, the apples and the onions just melt into each other. And it's almost tastes like, it's a combination between an applesauce and a chutney and they're, they're both really good. So, um, okay, I am going to show you the other two recipes. Um, the chicken, I'm gonna show you the chicken. I'm gonna put it on a little plate so you can see what it looks like um, while we're waiting for the, uh, the um, pork to come out. And I'm gonna look for a spoon, but I can't find, oh, here's a spoon, okay. So this has a lot, you know, I added chicken broth. I shouldn't have, I'm gonna tell you that right now. This is one of those sometimes faux pas, all of a sudden there's like too much liquid now. So you'll find those kinds of things you have to do, but this is great. I mean, it's, it's gonna be tasty. So that's what the chicken looks like. Uh, <laughs> these, unfortunately, these cameras are not as good as, you know, if you were here. But, but you'll see that everything is the mushrooms are brown. The chicken is, is kind of did not get you know overcooked. It's just the right temperature. Um, and I'll show you a picture of some of the like there's a piece here that's a little bit browner the chicken. And that's probably what you're looking for more. So um, and then the I'm going to put that away and I'm going to show you, as I said, the fish. I'm going to take a plate of that as well so you can see what it looks like as a serving. Um, all right. So I did just take a look at that. Delicious. Looks it's great. very, it's very, very moist and very tender. And um, the, the point with um, fish is um, the freshness factor. You know, it's just, you don't want to take away that freshness factor, but you want to just add some flavor to it. So um, it's a it's a very robust recipe. And, you know, what I would do if I were serving it is I would make sure I mean, this is the kind of thing that you would serve with um, either little mini roasted potatoes um, and some asparagus or green beans like Janet was talking. They put they they had green beans and asparagus, I think, and they put them on the side of their uh, chicken. So um, it's a it's a lovely recipe and it's very, very robust, as they say. So we've got a few more minutes before I can take out the pork. I'm just looking here. Um, the last thing that's going to happen is, and I'm looking at the clock. Yeah, it's getting there. I may take it out early and then I can finish cooking it afterward, but um, it does take about 15 to 20 minutes because it's a big piece of, uh, of pork. Um, the last thing that we're going to do once we take the pork out is we're going to take the pork out of the pan and let it warm, you know, continue that what happens with meat, by the way, is you want pork tenderloin to be 150. I'm going to answer that question about convection oven, Jean, because that's a great question too. Okay. So you want your pork tenderloin to be about 150. And when it gets to 150, you can take it out and it will rise in temperature about 10 degrees in the next 15 minutes, five degrees, five to 10 degrees in the next 15 minutes. So you don't want to overcook it. 155 is, is plenty. 160 is kind of on the high side for it. Chicken is more at that level, so 160 to 165. Um, so you want to rest, let the pork rest, and we're going to throw the um, pan with the apples and onions back on the stove and add the chicken broth to it to make like a sauce. And at the very end, if we want to, we're going to add that little bit of butter. Butter's an emulsifier, which means it takes those, those juices and kind of folds them together and makes them... Um, stick together and they become more creamy in texture. So it's always good to use butter. All right, I am gonna take a look actually at this pork so that we are, because I have five more minutes. Any more questions in the meantime? Um, Craig asked, I have cranberry chutney here. I assume that would work? Sure, you, you, you know, I didn't mean that you have to serve this with chutney. I just meant that the apples and onions will taste like a chutney. He could definitely use chutney as a side for this on the side. But you're going to find that the apples and the onions that are being cooked with it are going to give you that flavor of a chutney. So, okay, yeah, okay. yeah. But I, but yeah. Go so ahead. Paula's question about the convection oven. 
Oh, thank you. Yeah. Convection oven. So um, I, I couldn't read the whole question, Jean. I'm sorry. Yeah. If you have a convection oven, is it best to use it for these meals and do you adjust the temperature? Yes. So I love convection ovens for cooking everything. Um, probably not baking as much, but definitely adjust the temperature. You know, if the if the temperature, this recipe, the pork tenderloin calls for 425, I do it at 400 convection and it will cook in the same amount of time. Or you can keep it at 425 and take it out, you know, like 10, well, about five or 10 minutes beforehand. So I would go with lowering the temperature and making it convection. And then you can keep to the same time and it will cook in about the same, the same way. So Okay, very good. Okay. And there's one more question, Connie, yeah. from yes. Pat. Um, did Connie say we should cut down the amount of broth in the chicken recipe? Yeah, no, not the one, the recipe. I added it at the end. Keep to what the recipe said. Sometimes I look at these recipes, Pat, and I say, hmm, that looks like it's not going to have enough fluid. This one did. And you don't need to add any extra, any extra broth. So it's because it got a little bit watery because I did that. So this is a full disclosure class. And so <laughs> I want to make sure that you do it right your time. And this is one of those do as I say, not as I do, right? Okay, so thank I'm you. I'm going to uh, check the pork right now. It has another seven minutes or so, but I'm going to take it out and I'm going to remove the, uh, the pork needs oh, to cook a little bit longer. Looks beautiful. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to test it just so you can see what kind of temperature this is at. And it is at, yeah, it's not cooked, I can tell. It's only at 107. So it needs another, I'm saying 10, eight to 10 minutes. One part of it's at 117. So you want to get it to 150. You can feel it. You can see it's very, very loosey-goosey. But what I'm going to do is just for purposes of this class, so I'm going to take that off, put it back in the plate, and just take the um, onions and show you how we would do that. Now, don't do this at home. Keep yours under the, oh, and there's this little piece of pork that I'm going to enjoy. Um, so... We're going to put this on top of the stove here. We're going to be very careful not to touch that pan. That's the hardest thing about these pans is you forget. But see how soft these apples are now? And that's what I meant, Craig, about the um, chutney. It's going to come, you're going to be able to crunch these down with your spoon and make like a chutney that, that will be so good with this. And I'm going to add some chicken broth. And I'm going to... Uh, let it let it cook together. And keep cutting up that those apples and just make them very, it's almost like an apple sauce or a chutney. Okay, I'm gonna let that cook for a little while. I'm gonna look at my recipe here. And uh and reduce, as it says, reduce by half the liquid. And that's what you're trying to do. And then we'll do that in about five minutes, probably. Um, and then the last thing we'll do is add a little bit of butter just to give it some emulsification, as they say. So I'm going to let that sit. Um, I'm going to suggest that um, we take more questions. I don't think the, the pork's not ready, so I'm not going to show you what it looks like. But what you're looking for when you slice pork is some pink. Don't be frightened by the pink. Don't overcook it. It really is so much better when it's not overcooked and it's fine and perfectly safe for, for all of us to eat with a little bit of pink color to it. Okay. All right. So, so Shannon has, um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, there, no. Shannon says, sorry, we have to jump off the call. Thank you, Connie. And um, uh, Paula has a question. Will you share how you clean and season your cast iron pans? At Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So um, it was at the end of the question. Uh, and then Rose said, is there a preferred apple for this dish? Oh, very good questions, both of them. Okay, so after this dish is finished on both of these pans, I'm going to stick them in the sink, put some soapy water, and, and I got this great brush that is what you want to use, is a brush like this, and it's got bristles that are not totally hard, but they're pretty hard, and just give it a good scrub, and everything comes out of it. It will still have a little bit of a, um, I hate to use the word greasy, but it does have a little bit of a, it's got some leftover, um, you know, grease to it. I, it's not exactly what I mean to say, but uh, wipe that out a little bit and wipe the pan so that it's dry. 
Uh, and then what I bought, what I've done is I buy a um, an olive oil spray or a canola oil spray is fine. I mean, you know, vegetable oil spray. And I put one little squirt of it and I take a paper towel and roll it around and just get, get it into the pan. And then you're done. And I leave my pans, I hate to say it, they're so darn heavy. I don't want to put it, I don't want to have to go and bend down and pick that thing up. So I leave it on my stove. I mean, I feel like it's a, you know, it's like a flower vase for me. <laughs> um, I would just leave it on the stove. It's fine. It looks great. It means you cook. And, um, and that's what I do. And so I always have it available, but it looks clean. It looks great. It's got a, you know, that glisten of the oil that you've added and just rub it out so that you're sure that you've gotten the dirt that's off it, you know, but, but seasoning means, as it says, it's kind of, it, it gets the flavors. They stay in the pan. The fact is it's healthy to eat, but it's, they, they do say they stay in the pan. So that's part of it. Um, and then the other question, apples. So I went apple picking in uh, Western Mass and we found Liberty apples. And they, that's what I'm using tonight. Um, you could use Empires, Galas, um, Paula Reds. Um, Macintosh would be fine even for this because you want it to get mushy. And Macintosh apples, I would not usually say to use for something because they do get so mushy, but that's fine for this recipe. Something mushy is fine. So this is perfect. What's here in the pan, by the way, is exactly what you're looking for. So um, I'm gonna end up putting the pork back in there, but I wanted you to see that. I'm gonna put the pork back in and I'm gonna stick it in the oven now, even though it's a little bit out of sequence, that's fine. And um, I'm gonna let that go back and, and sit in the oven and finish cooking. So, so, delicious. so you, I don't see any more questions, but I actually have a question. And the question yes. is the meat thermometer. Now, what, what a brand is that? And where did you buy it? Yeah. So I went online. This is a thermopen or thermopen, T-H-E-R-M-A-P-E-N. And it's the classic. And Gene, okay. it does cost some money. I mean, I, 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 you know, it's like, 50, $75 probably, but I bet you can get a, a less expensive version. Um, you just basically want an instant read meat thermometer because as I open this up, it will show you the temperature and it's, you know, 89, it says, boy, it's hot in here. <laughs> I don't think that's true, 85. Um, but as soon as you put it in, it registers the temperature and that's what you're looking for. You don't want to have to keep it sitting there that It'll old be, fashioned kind, you mean that old fashioned kind that has the, yeah. Yeah, 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 it's great. And you don't have to, this thermopen is more expensive, but you don't have to spend that much. So I'm saying look for an instant read thermometer for a meat thermometer, and, but you need it. When you cook a lot, you need it because it's it just- It works important. on batteries, it works on batteries. It does, but it, I've had this battery three years maybe, but you've got a little pocket here that you can unscrew and you can replace the battery. I don't know that I ever have. So it's, I don't use it that often. You know, that's an important tool as is a weight scale, a little scale for your kitchen. You know, I, I weigh everything to, so that I know I'm putting the right measurements in. I've been taking a lot of classes at King Arthur Flower, by the way, I'm a big fan of King Arthur Flower and they do virtual classes all the time. I think I've taken 15 to 20 of them over the course of the pandemic. And it's been the, the joy um, that I've loved um and in cooking and um they they've got lots of great recipes but they also have lots of great tools and they, they probably have a brand of this thermo pen that's a little bit less expensive on their website as well but um it's it's good I, I can't remember if it was I, I think I was saying that for some other reason but I can't remember what it was so <laughs> so my husband just said I hope Santa will be looking for this thermo pen this year ah Santa Jean <laughs> <laughs> so um uh, king arthur flower is a wonderful place and there's one in vermont that i've gone to i think it's vermont or new Hampshire. it is it's, it's, it's vermont. vermont that's where i've been i've been up there but we didn't yeah. ended up uh, i take the classes virtually now but it's so much easier just to do those classes from your home so oh, I, I they're not cheap those classes are not cheap but it's, it's not a public library yeah a fun place to visit so it's a great place to visit though you're right right near um hanover new hampshire right near dartmouth college it's a beautiful place yes yes very yeah. good great yeah. well this was wonderful you Thank know and you I, i'm going to be eating this pork tomorrow night i think i'm looking for enjoy. enjoy any more questions anyone does anybody else have any more questions of connie if, if you do you can always send them to me and i will send them to her how's that
Absolutely. And some of you know me already. We have my email, I'm sure. So feel free. Yeah. Feel free to get in touch. Thank you, everybody, for being with us during Friends of the Library Week. It's really fun to have everybody here. And, Thank you um, very much for being here. We really appreciate it a lot. And um, we're getting all these wonderful messages back to you. Wonderful yeah. recipes and a lot of fun to watch you. Brava from Anne. And uh, let's see, S. Wheel. This is what a feat to cover three recipes in such a short time. You did an amazing job. I know I will find all three of these recipes helpful. I already have plans for all of them. Thank you. And thanks to the friends through the library for making this possible. And I say the same. And Marianne said, thank you, Connie. And John uh, Gallagher, thank you. Um, Marissa, thanks. Rose, thank you. And Jennifer, thank you, Connie. It was wonderful. Mary, thank you, Connie. Wonderful. And thank, thank you all you for so being much. here. It was great to see you. As Jacques Pepin would say, happy cooking. Oh, yay. Enjoy. Okay. Enjoy your friends and family. Yes. And um, please come visit us at the library. Um, and I hope to see you next time. Okay. So I'm going to say now. Thank you, Connie. Thanks. Good night. Thank you, Jean.